Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's indeed a privilege to stand before you all with the word of God one more time. I thank God for his faithfulness uh, in our lives. Amen. And I uh, thank God that he has given us the grace the three of us to go through the uh, current series that we've been going through that uh, we've called the new and living way. Um, if you'll put up that first slide, um, I will just kind of remind everybody where we're at. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the remind everybody where we're at and then kind of move on into my topic. We are currently in a new purpose. So we spoke about uh, throughout the year about the new covenant, the new birth, um, the, the God, how God gave us a new heart how to bear new fruit, a new family. And we've been, uh, just, uh, just in the last time we spoke, we've had a little bit of a break uh, in the topic. But the last time we spoke, he started this subtopic called New Purpose. That means we have been brought into this grace and brought into the kingdom of God with a new purpose. And that purpose now drives or brings us forward day to day as we live out uh, the Christian experience uh, following Christ. And uh, when Justin spoke about this topic uh, in the first uh, aspect of it, he uh, spoke about how our purpose of being redeemed was to for his glory. That we were called into this grace, into this new covenant, to shine forth the glory of Christ uh, to the world around us. Right? That is the new purpose that we've been given. And I want to uh, go into the next part of that, uh, with the new purpose. It is still under the umbrella of the same purpose we have, but it's just another aspect of it. If you go to the next slide, and uh, I uh, put a picture that uh, I really liked that Justin referred to is the uh, prism uh, example of how if you look at God, uh, or if you experience or know God, you know that He is comprised of various attributes that is unchangeable. That is who He is. Man may change who they are over the years, right? We might change and transform and uh, be different people over time. But God is unmovable, unshakable, uh, un, uh, unchangeable, Right? And so it is just like the, uh, but the different attributes that he has, it is just like when we split the light, as you might in science have seen this, is uh, you can see the colors of the rainbow, right? The seven components of light. It is not that the light became something else, but when the light is scattered through this glass prism, you can see the seven parts of the light that makes up the single light that we see, right? You all with me? It is uh, something that we learn in science. So the, another aspect of God is, because, before I go into kind of uh, the next aspect of uh, the new purpose that we have, we have to understand this aspect about God, is that is holiness, okay? so. Him being holy is an unchangeable aspect of God. Okay, when we think about holiness, sometimes we tend to think about holiness as following uh, certain rules or guidelines or trying to be, uh, you know, uh, perfect in certain aspects of our life daily. But really we have to step back and understand what, uh, what it means for God to be holy. He, he is not intending us to be holy uh, because he wants us to give us a, a bunch of laws and regulations to obey. But he wants us to be holy as he is holy. And I'll cover that in a minute. But the, we have to understand that this aspect of God is an inseparable part of who God is. Meaning we cannot say we worship God unless we come to understand that he's a holy God. Okay, every, and if you look at the Old Testament, uh, you can see when people have come face to face with this holy God, they've had a response 
of complete uh, surrender and submission. I'm just going to use an example that I have myself have spoken about or you've heard many men of God speak about is in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, the first few verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So we see this vision of Isaiah who was no ordinary person. He was a prophet that lived at the time, a prophet of Israel, a, a man of God that was entrusted with delivering the word of God. But he, when he himself has come and faced with the, uh, the holiness of God, that uh, you know, it's hard to describe what you mean by that unless you have a vision of this glorious God who is holy and mighty. And when he saw this vision of God and he saw even the angels who were the seraphims, they were crying out, they, were, they didn't even think themselves worthy to be in the presence of this holy God. And they were covering their eyes and their feet uh, and they were flying and they were crying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Amen. This gives us a reminder that when we see, have this vision of this God, one of the things that we have to be reminded of, or we are reminded of, and we have a true revelation of God's glory, is that He is holy. You know, you could say, why did they say holy, holy, holy three times? You could say it was for the Father Son and the Holy Spirit, who are all three holy uh, in their own uh, in their own self, or they were saying it, affirming it multiple times, again and again, that God is holy, holy, holy. Why am I saying this again and again? It's for us to remember that we, as Christians, when we follow Him, we worship a holy God. But what does it mean to be holy? That it is simply holiness is not something we do, but it's something who we are. So that means when God is holy, meaning there is no uncleanness, no evil thing that is in his presence, is a part of him. That means God's holiness is, uh, is something that, so when we, so for example, when we co compare Think of holiness, we, say, we tend to think of uh, other people, right? Which is good, you know, you, look, you have people to look up to. But those people might fail you sometimes. They might do things that you might, you know, that might not be what fits into the definition of God's holiness, right? So people fail us, but when we look at God, He is uh, never failing. He never withdraws from His aspect of being holy. Right? Even though we fail uh, sometimes in being holy, God is always holy. Right? That means no uncleanness, no evil thing, no wicked thing, no uh, thing that defiles is found in Him or in His presence. You all with me? So what this means is when we are called into this covenant, right, into, into His kingdom, he wants us to be like Him in all aspects, including His holiness, right? Which means separate, set apart, right? Away from the uncleanness that He saved us from, right? He wants us to be holy as well. And that is something that is uh, not that we can compromise on, right? That is not something that we can just argue away. 
is that the aspect of us being holy like he is holy, right? So if you go to the next slide, just wanted to hit a couple of points about that. Is there are two, I just split it into two parts of that. The first is, be holy as I am holy. That means, because as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 10, for they verily were for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit, but that we might be partakers of his holiness. He wants us to be partakers, not to uh, simply perform actions uh, to try to be holy. No, he wants us to partake in that divine nature of being holy, of being like him. Right, so just like that's why in uh, uh, in uh, in the Old Testament in Leviticus he says when he uh, you know we might wonder why did God call Israel to be a separate nation? Were they special? They were many times wicked or sometimes more wicked than the nations around them. They failed again and again. Why did God do that? And that's what you can find in uh, Leviticus 20 verse 26. He said, "What I." separated you to be a holy people. He was called them out to be separate, different from all the nations and kingdoms that existed at the time who only were practicing wickedness and uncleanness, right? So he said, I call you out so that you might be a shining example of what I am like on the earth. You all with me? That he, when people looked at you, I want them to see who I am. That's what God's purpose was. That's why he said in Leviticus 11, be holy as I am holy. Amen. Right? But unfortunately, Israel went away from God again and again and again. And they failed in this call of God, in this purpose of God behind separating Israel as a peculiar nation, as it says in uh, 1 Peter 2.9, right? But that's why Christ came down. It's so that he may fulfill that original purpose behind calling Israel through us. That he might fulfill that desire to separate a holy people unto himself through us. And that we might be the partakers of his holiness as we live out our lives, right, in this world. So when people see us, they might know there is something different about us. We just don't go, you know, are not swayed by where the wind takes us, right? We have certain standards that we like to adhere to, or we like, we hold on to certain truths that are uncompromisable, that are unshakable because we are partakers of God's holiness. God's truths or His holy aspects of His holiness does not change with cultures, does not change with time, over time, they, they are unchanging. So He wants us to follow holiness. Right, so that's the first part, being partakers. Again, the same thing, it says in Hebrews 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the God. See the Lord. So he's saying the simple truth. Without holiness, no man shall see, see the Lord. Unless we are partakers of his divine nature, we cannot see God. It is just a simple truth laid out by Hebrews. Uh, the second part of it is that I wanted to talk about is perfecting holiness. See, well, sometimes, you know, we reach a certain point in our lives and we think we're just perfect, right? We've achieved it all, we're doing all these things, we're in a good spot, and we're just perfect, better than other people. And But God is saying, in Isaiah uh, 65, 5. Let's read that real quick. Isaiah 65, 5. It says, 
Um, well, I'm going to read three to five. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all day. So he's saying, there's people that uh, do wicked things, think wicked things, are doing whatever they want. But just because they're, you know, they do these outward things, they're saying, stay away from me, all you other people. I am holier than you. I am better than you because I do, I maybe have a ministry or whatever, right? I am on the worship team, I'm speaking before the church, I'm a pastor, and, but in reality when God is looking at them he's saying you're no better than anybody else and he's saying those people that say I am holier than you they're like a smoke in my ear uh, nostrils right it's like just get away from me you're no better than anybody else so the point I'm trying to say is as Christians we cannot just like Paul Apostle Paul said, I cannot think that I already apprehended for that which I am called into Christ. Not that I've already attained this perfection. That I am striving forward till the end of my life so that I might gain Christ. Amen? So we should never think that we are reached a place that we have reached this holiness or this somehow this illusion in our mind that we are somehow better than somebody else. No, no, no. Because just like Isaiah, when you see God for who He is, you only realize more of your imperfections. You realize more of where we are lacking. Not more of where we are good at. We only we realize the areas where we have to improve. I'm not talking about this in a sense that we have to always constantly, you know, in a self-defeatist way in our mind, we think that, you know, we don't have to go the opposite way either, right? We're just the lowest of the low. We're so beaten down. No, we have to have the confidence in Christ. We also understand that we're in a process of true transformation, right? But just like that prism has to reveal the nature of God, we have to have this revelation of Christ. This perfect revelation of Christ that has to be constantly improving our vision of God's holiness. That means that what we were a few years ago is not who we should be today. Constantly striving to improve, just like it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. We have to strive. That should be our desire. This is what I meant when we say we have a new purpose. Is one of them being to be holy like God is holy. To perfect holiness in our lives. To improve His, uh, 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 his nature or to be transformed into His nature every day. Right? On a constant basis, year by year, day by day, month by month. We have to perfect holiness in our life. That's why in First Thessalonians it says, the will of this is the will of God. Amen. Your sanctification. God didn't just call us in here to give a membership in a club and to just kind of coast by. No, the will of God is our sanctification. Amen. Is our perfection into the nature of Christ. That's why in uh, Thessalonians, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that, so that we might be blameless in our mind, body, and soul at the appearance of Christ. That He wants us to be blameless, perfect like Him, right? But continuing in this journey. So, um, uh, so if you go to the next slide, so, but we might think, okay, how do we, you know, we're struggling with the sin of uh, all these sins, all these things that we deal with every day, right? How can I be 
holy like God? How can I remove the stains of the sin that, that are uh, upon me, right? Um, uh, that's why I read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So uh, the Bible says that Abel's blood still speaks for the injustice that was done for him. Right? Or the Israelites sacrificed many bulls and goats and animals in the Old Testament to, uh, to, to uh, cover their sins. Right? Uh, in a continuous fashion. But we are not in that covenant now. Right? We can shed behind our past sins and move forward. We can be, uh, you know, move forward in our holiness. We don't have to hold on to the guilt of the past things that we have struggled with. We can be holy like He's holy. But it only happens through the blood of Christ. Amen? There is this unending spring that has come forth from the cross. It is the blood of Christ that is freely flowing to any who run to the cross. To be cleansed and, and to be sanctified from their sins. Right? So when we think of holiness of God, it is not a, a, a prospect that is uh, self-defeating. It is not a prospect where God, I, I am not worthy uh, to be in your presence. Uh, look at all these people that are better than me. No, God is saying... My blood is not like the blood of Abel that was shed. Of all the bulls and goats and all the animals that were shed. No, my blood renews anew, renews you like new. Washes as clean as white, white as snow. His blood is able to cleanse uh, the worship team come forward. So if you read uh, Hebrews chapter 12, it says, you know, we're not coming to Mount Sinai. Right? The mountain where... You know, they, they were afraid to even come near, right? That they were afraid when they heard the voice of God and they were like shaking. It's, uh, it says in verse, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 21, uh, even Moses said how terrible was that sight when they saw God come down on the mountain when he gave the laws. I exceedingly fear and quake. But he's saying, you're not on Mount Sinai anymore. You've come to Mount Zion, the mountain of grace and the, the free flow of the, of the presence of God. The eternal spring that flows freely for any, anyone that comes to His presence. The blood of Christ that washes us anytime, right? Anytime that we have need, we can come back to Him. It's not this one-time experience that when we fall, when we realize the sin we've done, we can come back to this fountain. That's why I put the words of this old hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. That, so the, 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 what we have to think about is listening to God's voice. Hearing his word that is testifying in our hearts. And turning to this fountain that flows freely for anybody, anybody who wants to be washed white as snow. And this has to happen in our lives in a daily manner so that we might partake of His holiness. This is the purpose that we are called to be. So that what He said to Israel, what they failed to do, to be holy like I am holy. And this is the purpose of the new covenant, to be holy like he is holy. May his name be glorified.